says the choir really doesn't like for you to clap for them, but when they start clapping for themselves, I'll never believe it. <laughs> now, before you turn in your Bibles, give me your undivided attention, please. Next Sunday is the annual Sunday of the year. We have our stewardship emphasis, the highest attendance of the year, and uh, we sign our pledge cards for the work of the Lord for another year. If this were any other church in the world, I'd be scared to tell you that, and I'd have to sneak up on your blind side. But First Baptist Church folks are exceptional people. They love to give. They are proud that the Lord has blessed their church. They're winners, and we look forward to coming and making our commitment to Christ that year, that Sunday for the year, and our attendance goes up. And so I'll give you my annual, I'll lay my annual money sermon on you next Sunday. And the following Sunday is Palm Sunday, and I'll preach on the cross. The next Sunday is Easter, and I'll preach on the resurrection. So for three Sundays, we won't be in Revelation, and four weeks from today, we'll return to the seventh chapter. Now this is good because we have come today to a perfect, logical break in Revelation. Jesus Christ is coming back to take charge of his world. The opening chapter, verse of chapter uh, 6, show the, 5, show the Lord Jesus taking the title deed to the world. He unrolls the title deed like a Roman scroll. Each seal is some new phase of judgment as he purges this rebellious planet to make it the kind of responsive, willing one that he wants to rule over. The first six phases of that judgment are in the sixth chapter. And the entire seventh scroll with its seven bowls or vials and its seven seals take chapters 7 to 19. And so today in coming to the sixth one, we come to a perfect break because when we return, we will spend the 12 chapters and the months that it takes on just the seventh and last seal. The worst is yet to come. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, the apocalypsis, the unveiling, we've already seen the first one, the white horse, is a picture of the Antichrist who counterfeits what Jesus does and brings a pseudo peace on earth. Probably this peace on earth is centered around some kind of uh, Israeli peace emphasis that he pulls off which makes the world acclaim him, perhaps with all of the Arab nations, we don't know. And then he breaks it, and so the second horseman comes, and that's war. That's the, the red, the bloody horse. And this false peace breaks out in war. When Christ comes and brings real peace, it's followed by no war. So that's the Antichrist. The third horseman, as we have seen, brings a, is a black horse. And that always speaks of famine. The fourth one is the, the pale, sickly, greenish, sick-looking horse. The whole world is dying and and the animal kingdom is, uh, is starving to death, and it's just a, a terrible, terrible thing. Now, when the Antichrist, as we have seen, controls the world, it will be quite easily easy for him to take over everything. We have a system of communication of the whole world through the satellites. We have the a banking system of economics. Three of Houston's six largest banks have just gone on this system by which without credit cards or cash, money is transferred e electronically all over the world. It's being done at this very moment. That is not to say that three of Houston's six largest banks are of, are of the devil any more than this building is of the devil. But the devil, uh, thank you, banker. Uh, <laughs> somebody will, uh, when we're all gone, somebody will take it all over, and that'll, of course, uh, be, be the Antichrist. Now, I don't know the kind of rates you guys are charging, whether maybe we ought to say you're the devil or not. <laughs> anyhow, anyhow, the devil got me to say that, didn't he? <laughs> the, uh, the result will be that a, a system of a cashless society we talked about last week will, will arise, and uh, so somebody will control all of this. And a person who doesn't receive his mark and acknowledge this world ruler by receiving his mark will, uh, will be beheaded. And your allegiance to Christ, if you are converted during that time, will cost you your life. 
The people that have passed through the tribulation and have been saved out of it, we saw last week, are under the altar or pictured as being already passed from and safe from future judgment. And we saw last week that they were pleading with the Lord, how long are you going to let this slaughter in the tribulation, costing Christians their lives who are slave, saved out of tribulation, go on, do something. And the Lord says to them, you just sit over here in your little robes and wait a while, there's more. In fact, probably more are to be saved in the fifth and the sixth and seventh seal than in the fifth seal. Now, the sixth seal is a great earthquake. And it's an earthquake that's not like any earthquake the world has ever seen. But it's not the last earthquake which is going to be so bad everything will come apart and it'll all blow up and at the end of the tribulation there'll be a whole new heaven and a new earth. So in the sixth seal we see a great shaking of the world. For God is going to get this little rebellious planet's attention. I want you to understand that the Christians are already gone. Raptured, removed, do not go through this. But I'm saying to you on radio this morning and on television and hundreds and thousands of us here that have heard these sermons today that if you're not saved, you will go through it. And if you think that you're going to find it easier then when great judgment is upon the world to be saved, then you would find it to be saved now while it's popular to be a Christian, you're mistaken. And I urge you to not wait, not delay, not run the risk, but to come to Christ today. This sermon today is strictly to the unsaved. It's straight from the shoulder and from the hip and from the heart because judgment and devastation and tragedy are coming on this world. And if you, I want to say this one thing. If you will not respond to the love of God now, it is less likely that you will respond to the judgment of God then and be saved. It'll never be as easy, and well, I'll prove that from the text. It'll never be as easy to come to Christ as it is today. All right, with that introduction, let's turn then to Revelation 6 and open the sixth seal. Revelation 6, verse 12, the sixth seal. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide from us the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now in the fifth seal we saw the martyred souls that were under the altar safe, passed from judgment, that knew what was going on in the earth and were pleading with God, how long will you let it go on and more Christians be slain and at the cost of their life and their own beheading come to you? And the Lord says, be quiet, there's a whole lot more, the worst is yet to come. And the sixth and seventh seal supersede anything that has happened to date. And what we are seeing now is the beginning of the end, the beginning of the breakup of the universe. We have seen the breaking up of society, the breaking up of nations and governments. Now God takes this little earth that man is on and he begins to shake it to its wisdom teeth to get rebellious man's attention. Hey, I'm God. And I'm giving you one last chance to turn to me. And it will be in the form of the most devastating and awesome earthquake the world has ever seen. It is in the plan and economy of God to use the shaking of man's environment to get his attention. We have reason to believe that the first Worldwide, the first, the worldwide flood in Noah's day, which was God's judgment upon a whole race of people, 
a whole world of people, and only eight were saved out of it. Was so awesome, scientists believe, and they know that a worldwide flood did occur, that it was coupled with either the result of or triggered by a massive earthquake. Genesis says the fountains of the deep opened up and the deep within the deep, indicating that there are giant reservoirs of water even beneath the earth and as we know and, and under the oceans and, and the earthquake opened them up and there was a massive flood as well as the heavens that opened from above. We have reason to believe, though not specifically stated, that when God wanted to get the attention of Pharaoh and Egypt, and reach down and say in the breaking of the bondage of sin and giving freedom from his people, let my people go. That the tremendous ecological disturbance of famine and pestilence and disease and boils and signs in the sun and fire from heaven and uh, famine and rivers turned to blood might have well been the catalyst, the result of another earthquake, which historians say obviously hit the world a second major quake about that time. And what of Calvary? When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the Lord God from heaven turned his head and could not look on that awful experience. And when God turns his head and his back and his love from a man, from a world, such that him that had known no sin could for six hours become sin, that God could smash his judgment on sin for us on Jesus Christ, the skies blackened and the graves, the bowels of the earth rumbled and the graves split and people rose from the dead and rocks and boulders and mountains busted right in half. The world saw the greatest ecological disturbance it's ever known since the flood. Always the judgment of God comes in shaking up man's physical environment. And then there's this earthquake, but I want to say this. This earthquake that I'm speaking about somewhere early in the tribulation is still not the worst which is yet to come. The final earthquake, though this one is so devastating that it even affects ecology and the environment to the degree that it sends off ramifications that affect the very universe, is not the worst one. The worst one is the one at the end of the tribulation when it is so massive that God dissolves every physical thing in the universe and creates it all over again in a new heaven and a new earth. Now that one is forecast in 2 Peter 3, verse 10. I call your attention there. 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a fervent noise, and the elements sh shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The whole earth and universe will be destroyed. Now after this massive earthquake at the beginning of the tribulation, there is still an earth. There are still people on the earth being saved. The battle of Armageddon has yet to be fought on the earth. This is not the last great end of time earthquake. This is one like has never been seen. But the one Peter is describing is at the end of the earthquake, end of the age, and it's so massive that everything burns up, melts, vanishes, dissolves. Now because these things shall be dissolved, verse 11, what manner of persons ought ye to be in holy conversation and godliness? Now, in the Greek, that means in, in a, a, a holy manner of living related to righteousness. In other words, because our homes and cars and boats and TV sets and watches and bank accounts and everything we've got is going to go up in smoke anyway, how ought we not in righteousness to have our priorities straight and be putting godliness and serving Christ and that the world would know him first in our life? We say amen, but remember that when you decide next Sunday how much money you're going to give to the church and the work of Jesus in relationship to how much we're going to spend on ourselves and the things of this world which are going to blow up anyhow. Now a word from our announcer. Verse 12, 
looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. All that will produce a new heaven and a new earth. That's the last one, when it's all gone up in smoke. The one we're studying now is in the tribulation, and it's before that, and it's so bad there's been nothing likened to it from history. Now, I want you to keep your finger right there in Revelation 6, and I'd like you to turn back to Luke 21, and let's read them simultaneously. Now, Jesus Christ is speaking in Luke 21, and who is the author of the Revelation? St. John the Divine? Of course not. We know that. The angel, no, he's just dictating it to John. The author that is speaking is I, Jesus. So we're not surprised to find that Jesus tells us the same thing in Luke 21, verse 25, and in the same order that he tells us in Revelation 6. Now, now kind of fold your Bible under where you can read them both together. We're looking at Revelation 21, 25, and we're looking, I mean, Luke 21, 25, and we're looking at Revelation 6, 12, all right? And there shall be signs in the sun. The first thing that happens, the result of this earthquake, is the sun becomes black. And in the moon, the next thing that happens is the moon becomes as blood. It doesn't turn to blood, it is as blood. And next, there is distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. What is the result of an earthquake? Tidal waves. In Revelation 6, 12, the stars of heaven fall unto the earth. The result of this great earthquake is so dev devastating. And look at the end of verse 14, and every mountain and every island is moved out of their place. Verse 26, what's the result of all this? Men's hearts failing them for fear, looking for a new heaven and a new earth. Now, what's down here in the verse, in, in, in the end of verse 16 and, in verse 16 in Revelation 6? Men are so scared they're hiding in the rocks and the mountains saying, Fall on us! Fall on us! Hide us from him that sitteth on the throne and from the Lamb. So this is the same thing Jesus talked about and it will occur before the coming of king, the King in glory at the end of the tribulation. Now let's go through this passage starting with verse back in Revelation 6, verse number 12. The opening of the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. The word earthquake is from the word seismos, the Greek word. And we know what the Greek word seismos is translated into to English, seismology or seismograph, by which we measure the shaking of the earth. And he says the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon as blood. Underscore the two words as in there. The, the sun does not turn black. It is as black as that. And the moon does not turn to blood. It is as red as blood. It looks like it's blood. And it looks like it's black. There's a difference. Now this sackcloth of hair is the most shiny and black and glistening kind of angora hair from, from uh, an animal that they made Bedouin tents out of that only the king stayed in. These were notoriously wicked people. Now what is the result of an earthquake physically? There are three, three things. First, there is famine, which sets off disease and pestilence and shakes up the animals and disturbs the balance of nature and causes pestilence and, and grasshoppers and beetles and disease. Another thing that happens in an earthquake, of course, is, is tidal waves. The earth is shaken and the seas are shaken. But what is the most immediate thing that happens when an earthquake happens to a city, have you seen pictures of San Francisco and other world cities? Fire! Buildings crumple, gas tanks explode, gas lines erupt, fire, fire, and smoke. Now he is saying that the result of this great earthquake that comes on the world is so awesome as the world is on fire. No wonder there is famine and death and disease. There are three or four years to go yet that men have to live in this stinking, rotting, broken land that's left over. God, when man sinned, 
Man's sin affected his body. It affected his, his environment. It affected the animal kingdom. It affected society. It affected the earth. It affected the universe. The curse of God is on it all. And all that's been redeemed of man is his soul. Jesus said, when, this, when the coming of Christ gets close, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Paul said, what redemption? To wit, the witness of the body and the earth, a new heaven and a new earth. That is yet to be. He's going to redeem it. He's going to take charge of it. A new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be so peaceful that the animals, the wolf and the lion, will lay, and the lamb will lay down together. A little child will play on the, on the den of a wasp and it won't hurt him. The animals won't hurt. The animals won't attack. Man in harmony with God, the elements in harmony with God, nature in harmony with God. But before then, you see, God's a big one to bring previews, you know. The millennial reign of Christ on earth is a preview of what heaven's going to be like as the deposit of the Holy Spirit, the down payment, the earnest money of the Spirit in our heart right now is there also a little preview of what the millennium's going to be like. And the tribulation is a preview of what hell's going to be like, and this is a preview of what the tribulation's going to be like. And uh, this first earthquake is a picture of what the last earthquake will be like, which is so devastating, nothing survives. And it probably means that the smoke from a world on fire, scorching everything, leaving man to suffer and struggle to survive for three or four more years of hell on earth, that the smoke is so massive that the whole sky for two or three years is blackened and you can't even see the sun Nothing will grow, death and starvation, because the sun can't shine. And it'll so blacken the skies with the smoke of an earth. It's exploded the result of an earthquake that'll look like the sun's turned black. And he goes on to say, and the moon became his blood. The moon is not turned to blood. The moon looks as blood looks. How does blood look? It looks red. The flames from an earth that burns for two or three years from this previous preview earthquake will so brighten the sky that in the daytime the sky will be black. At the nighttime, the moon will look like it's red. You wouldn't see black smoke at night against a black sky. That's in the daytime. At the nighttime, all you see is the red flames so highlighting the sky that as you look at the moon, all you can see is a red moon and it looks like it's turned to blood. Verse 13, And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. The universe is interrelated. What the sun does what, what affects the moon. What the moon does affects the earth. What the earth does affects the rest of the planets. It's all interrelated. And this earthquake and the resultant ecological unbalance of the atmosphere with years of smoke and flame and dying and starvation with the, the world turned upside down and the, the seasons no more because we have no more the power of the sun and the, on the moon and the moon to control the tidal waves and to control the seasons and everything's in chaotic disorder such that even the stars and the other planets are affected. He says he's going to shake this earth so bad that it's going to be like a, the stars will fall to the earth. The stars, the meteors come crashing into this earth like a fig tree that throws down her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. Untimely means premature. When figs are ripe, when apples are ripe, a little wind will blow off a ripe apple or a ripe fig. But when they're premature, they're untimely, they're ready to pick, they're green. It takes one whale of a storm to shake them off. He said, like a man shaking a green fig tree so hard as to knock off the figs. God will shake this earth so bad as to knock down the stars from heaven. And what is the result of the stars falling from heaven? Verse 14, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Did you ever take a window shade and pull it slowly down to the bottom and turn it loose? Zap! Up it goes all at once. Just like a man has pulled a switch, flipped a switch, or pulled a shade, 
This earthquake will affect the ecological balance of the universe so bad, so fast, the stars will come down so quickly that it'll look like zip, you've just rolled up the scroll of the heaven and it's disappeared and it is no more. Will you turn to chapter 16? Verse 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. You don't find the islands, and you don't find the mountains. Now I want you to turn back, if you will, please, to the end of verse 14, back in chapter 6. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Do you know what that word literally means? It means changed places. The oceans are where the continents were. The continents were where the oceans were. The scientists have a theory about something called the continental drift theory. And their theory is that at one time all the continents were together in some massive, convulsive, cataclysmic occurrence, shook the earth and they started to move. You look at the arrangement like uh, the USA to England and South Africa, I mean, Africa and, uh, to Europe and some of these things, and uh, South America to Africa, it looks like they maybe were all together. And I think they say they're still drifting about a foot a year apart. Now, this is saying that this thing will rattle the teeth of this old world to get the attention of unpenitent sinners so vastly, so powerfully that things are going to be changed around and they're not even going to be where they used to be. Maybe the Atlantic Ocean will be in the middle of Texas and, and New York City will be in... Uh, well, we could suggest a lot of places that maybe it ought to be, but <laughs> everything changed around. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what is the result of all this? The result of this changing of places, of things physical, charges, results in a changing of places, of, chain, of things literal and physical, spiritual, alive, people. I want you to read something here. Verse 15. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, the bondmen, the free men, hid themselves, scared to death in the rocks of the mountains. In descending order, we start with the greatest. The kings of the earth, the presidents, the potentates, the rich men, the movie stars, the financial entrepreneurs, the great men, the rock stars, and the famed athletes, everybody that everybody loves and admires, they're the first to go. They're the first to say, hey, our money and our fame and all this stuff isn't worth it. They're the first ones to coward, to show cowardice and check it all in. And then in descending order, then the chief captains and us everyday folks and servants and all the rest of us. Then it just says everybody. And they are saying to the world that they who are supposed to have had the most in their physical security now admit they had the least because they had no spiritual security in the Lord. The whole system of the world is a sham, young people. Listen to this. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. First of all, when he came to earth, they tried to kill the messenger. But let me tell you something. They slaughtered him. This is the Lamb on the cross, high and holy, lifted up that they see. They slaughtered the messenger, but they got the message. They now understand who Jesus Christ is. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the Lamb. Every man, woman, boy on earth, on earth, girl on earth, knows that this judgment is coming from Jesus Christ. They know exactly where it's coming from. Turn to Revelation chapter 9, verse 21. 
neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Turn to Revelation chapter 16. Verse 17. It gets worse. It gets worse in the seventh vial. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came out a vo great voice out of the temple of the heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Tribulation's over. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not seen, not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. This is what happens to the last one. And the great city was divided into three parts. Jerusalem split in three pieces. And the cities of the nation fell in the Jerusalem, and the great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give him unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God. Because of the plague of the hail, for the plague was thereof was exceeding great. What is the result of all this judgment and shaking on the earth? Men turning to God by the millions. Oh, we see you. It was from you. We're so sorry. We repent. Save us. No, it makes them harder. The world doesn't turn to God in judgment. The world blasphemes God in judgment. I'm going to conclude with what I began with. People all the time say, why didn't God do something? As the sinners sometimes challenge God. A man said to me once, I would believe in God if he did something. I said, like something. He, well, send an earthquake or, 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 or dry up the Mississippi River. Or do something. He's going to do something. And still they won't respond. Every judgment of God that came on Egypt made Pharaoh harder. The sin unto death is like that. The unpardonable sin is like that. Every time God tries to get your attention, you get harder and harder and harder until finally to the unpenitent lost man, God hardens his heart and says, okay, go on. There's nothing I can do for you. He will not force your will. Now, I know, oh, I know that I am speaking, that I am preaching. And this television and radio and stations and to you, Many of you, well, you're Methodists and Baptists and what have you, but many of you are not really saved. And you say, well, you know, there's, there, there's something kind of sadistic in us all. Boy, if, if he'd really hit me hard enough, I know I'd turn to him. The harder he hits you, the harder you become. It's the pride in man who wants to hit back. Jesus Christ did more miracles by the power of the Spirit to arrest their attention in the face of Israel than he ever did in the face of Egypt. He kept saying, without signs and wonders you won't believe, and still only a pitiful amount believed. And finally, the Holy Spirit they would not receive and respond to and believe in and give to. Jesus, by Spirit, was pulling them to him. They got so hard, they crossed it all off and said, Oh, you and your Holy Spirit and your gospel, you're all of the devil. And Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And he warned them because they had committed a sin so devastating in their stolid indifference and rebellion even God couldn't get through the hard cement of their soul. I want to tell you again, you're fooling yourself if you're waiting for God to do some forceful, awful, devastating, judgmental thing to shake you up and get you to Jesus Christ. If the love of God and what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross does not Touch your heart and cause you to come just as you are to the Lord Jesus Christ. The chances are a million to one that the judgment of God will not either. That it, like they, will only make you 
harder. Oh, unsafe friend, how I pray, how I plead with you. I beseech you in Christ's own stead, be ye reconciled to God. Harden not your heart. Come softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Come. Our Father, we want to ask you that men and women listening at home will bow their head right now and say, Lord Jesus, I want to respond to your love. I want you to come into my heart. And we pray for many that are here, Lord, who are not saved, that they'll come to you too. And they'll receive the Lord Jesus Christ in love while he's dealing softly, while he's tugging tenderly. Come home. As our heads are bowed, I want to ask every one of you here, don't leave, don't look around, don't disturb or move unless you're coming this way to the altar, to the front. I want to ask every child the question. Do you know you need Jesus? Don't wait till you get older and your heart gets harder. And every teenager, are you aware of what you're doing and running the risk and rejecting Jesus? And every adult, you have good intellect. You have heard the truth. You are reasonable people. You have seen it from the scripture. You know it to be the truth. I want to ask every child and teenager and adult, unsaved, without Christ, not Baptist or Methodist, that's not the question. You know I'm not really saved, or I don't know if I'm saved. I want you to get up from your feet and come down the aisle right now. Come on, get up and stand and come. Give your life to Christ. Step out in the house. I want Jesus. I want to be saved. If you're here and you already are a Christian, you want to join our church, you come on the first word because your coming will help somebody else to be saved. Get up and come on. Do it right now. Don't wait. God bless you. Let's stand. God bless you. Here's one and here's one. We're waiting for you. Come on, let's sing together. Softly and tenderly. Come on, sing it.